So we'll read together the text, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Thus far the reading of our text. Beloved brothers and sisters of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to understand the grace, the assurance that we have, that God gives us in this new life, we can't ignore the Old Testament. The book of Hebrews is a book that helps us with that, connecting what God did in the Old Testament with what God finally fulfilled in the New Testament. In Hebrews, the author, he spends a lot of time contrasting the Old Testament, all the things that happened under the Old Covenant, with the New Covenant. And this explanation, this contrast that the author of Hebrews does, it would have been great for Jewish converts to see how God pulled history along until he finally fulfills it in Jesus Christ. Because of this, uh, many authors do suggest that book of Hebrews was initially written to a Jewish audience. The Jewish audience would have known all the references to the sacrifices, to how the temple was arranged in the Old Testament. Now you might sit there thinking, well, I'm not a Jew. How does it hold for us? What can we learn from this? In the book of Hebrews, we gain a greater appreciation for the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. A greater awareness of the price our salvation costs him. An increase in the joy of the new life that we have. And then also a renewed passion for serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this afternoon we look at Hebrews chapter 10, 19 through 25. Under this theme, the blood of our great high priest assures us in our new life. We'll see three things. It gives purity to our plea. It gives confidence in our profession, and it gives purpose to our action. Now, if you've ever found yourself in the difficult position of an unworthy petitioner, you know what the cry of a convicting a conscience is like. Whether in prayer or, or whether when you're coming to present a request to another person, on the outside, you present a, a lovely picture of piety, of righteousness. But on the inside, there's that convicting conscience, crying out against everything that you're saying, everything that you're doing. A convicting conscience speaks against that which you want to do because you know that you're not worthy. You know you cannot come legitimately with this request if they knew everything that was going on in the inside. The actions on the outside, the convicting conscience on the inside. This is the position of sinners. You and I, of every human being that come for a holy God. Because though man and, and women were created in the image of God, they rejected God as Father, and they now approach a holy God unworthy. Unworthy petitioners approaching a magnificent king. So the question is, why should God even listen? Why should God listen to you? Why should God much less answer any of your petitions? Why should God answer any of your prayers? 
What right do you have to claim that before a holy God? Because God decided to show his grace. And first, you see that in the Old Testament. The author of Hebrews, he brings that out. In the Old Testament, God instituted the temple worship along with all of its sacrifices and offerings so that unworthy petitioners, unworthy people who wanted to come before God, who needed to come before God, could approach a holy God. But that system was tiresome, cumbersome. That system had to be repeated time and time again, daily, weekly, monthly, year in, year out. And in the end, every time they came, they felt like they still were unworthy. Nothing seemed to change. Imagine, if you will, just for a moment, if we still had some form of that today. How hard it must have been to to bring bulls and goats as a sacrifice Every time that you sinned, you had to bring a sacrifice before God. Cleanse yourself to find forgiveness. Imagine in our day and age, if every time you did that, you had to somehow pay, pay another a fee for every sin that you committed. And every time you sinned again, it had to happen again. You had to bring more of your sacrifice and more of your sacrifice. And time and time and time again, the cycle would never end. That weight, that pressure that would, you would feel year in, year out would have been immense. And then, even on top of that, as an average Israelite, you weren't allowed to go into the most holy place. The holy of holies. You weren't alo- allowed to go and stand in front of the tabernacle where God was said to dwell. You can never stand in front of the king and plea for forgiveness. You can never request mercy and blessing because it always had to go through the high priest, through a mediator. And then even then, the high priest could only enter, as we read in Hebrews 9, could only enter the Holy of Holies and approach God's holy throne. But he could only do that once a year. And he could never do it without offering blood for himself because he himself was unholy. So, in our text, for the writer of Hebrews to write to his his hearers, for them to hear these words, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, would have been mind-boggling. After so many years of not being able to enter the holy place, of being reminded of your uncleanness, of how you were unholy and couldn't go before a holy God, So many years of never being able to enter the hall of the king and now to say we can go into the throne room to the most holy place. Unthinkable. And then to do so with that word confidently. Confidently. We can be thankful that the old covenant was never meant to last. That it had to be set aside. That there was a plan, a purpose, that God was bringing forward. And so the author of Hebrews can say, let us draw near to God with confidence. Why? Because we are unworthy petitioners no longer. The sacrifice, the one sacrifice that was needed was made. And that sacrifice covers all of our sin. Jesus Christ's blood has given purity. It has cleansed our plea. Jesus Christ, our great high priest, was seated at the right hand of God as a mediator. And a sign that he had been given complete authority. So how can we draw near? We can draw near with a sincere heart. In full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled. To cleanse us from a guilty conscience. A sincere faith, a sincere heart, author of Hebrews says. It's a heart that's true, that's pure. Completely through. There's no lie, no deception found within it. No covering up. And it's the real deal, the authentic object. And how has this been done? 
Our hearts have been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. So often that we say, since he see your heart in full assurance of faith, we hear those words, come before God in sincere faith and full assurance, sincere heart and full assurance of faith. But then our conscience, it, it starts to cry out and convict us, accuse us, it begins to prick holes again in, into what you're saying. Exposing your insincerity. We see in our hearts and as we come before God, we, we know that you know, we feel like unworthy petitioners. Who am I to come before the Holy God? I am not worthy. But beloved, that's exactly the point. It's not the purity of your own heart. Not the sinfulness, the holiness of your own heart that gives you a sincere heart and full assurance of faith to approach God. But the fact that your insincere hearts have been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ. Have been covered by His blood. And that blood opens new life for us. That gives purity to our plea. How? By covering with His blood the holes that conscience pricks. By covering the black holes that we know are there. By covering them with the blood of Jesus that says, because of that blood I am forgiven. Because of that blood I can come before a holy God and because of that blood I'm not an unworthy petitioner and I can come before God in prayer. In the Old Testament, the sacrificial system, in Hebrews 9, verse 13, that we read, we read the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of heifers sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. They were told they were clean, but it was never apparent. So we're reminded again that they had to do it time and time again, but now we may have confidence in the cleansing blood of Christ because what was foreshadowed in the Old Covenant Petitioners coming before God was made reality by the blood of Jesus Christ. The author says we have a new and living way. A new and living way. Living because Jesus Christ himself lives. Opened for us through the curtain. And so we can draw near to the holy throne of God with a sincere heart. Having our bodies washed with pure water. Because that's the work of Christ. Washing us. Baptism is a sign and a seal of that promise that as surely as water washes away dirt, so Christ, by His blood and Spirit, washes our hearts clean. Our conscience are clean, our heart is pure, and we can approach the throne of God with confidence. And so for those who plea before the Holy God on the basis of Christ's blood, their feet is purified because of Christ's blood. And Christ, our mediator, intercedes for us. Beloved brothers and sisters, what a comfort and a joy to know that you can approach the throne of God with confidence before our Heavenly Father. Not because you come dressed for the occasion or because he can't see what's inside because he knows exactly what's inside. No, you can come because he sees what's inside and he has cleansed and purified that by the blood of Christ. Now secondly, it also gives us, Christ's blood gives us confidence in our profession. As the author of Hebrews said, let us together hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. The blood of our high priest, it assures us of new life. It gives us confidence as we come before God, but it gives us confidence also in our profession, in our confession that we have. It's, it's a joy to, to think about it because let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. You don't need to fear the accusation of hypocrisy. Because just as the blood of Christ cleanses us and purifies our plea before God, so also it's the blood of Christ 
that gives us confidence in the middle of a culture that's hostile to Christianity, that wants nothing to do with it, and ends up wants nothing more than to see a Christian fall, a Christian doubt, a Christian worry, a Christian fear. And in the midst of that, the author of Hebrews says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. New life is a life of confidence that doesn't waver from the good confession. Now this idea of of confession, it comes up before in Hebrews. Hebrews 3 verse 1, the author says, Therefore fix your thoughts as on Jesus the apostle and high priest whom we confess. Second time, Hebrews 4, verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Notice both times in those places, in Hebrews 3 and then Hebrews 4, whenever it combines that concept of fixing your thought, it always focuses and places your attention on Jesus Christ. He is the object of confession. That idea of object of, of confession or object of profession, it may be hard to wrap your mind around. So if I can use a, a brief illustration. Last summer I had the chance to witness a Pinewood Derby contest. If you know what that means, it's um, the young men, women, and sometimes old men living as young men would make these little cars and then race them all together da- down a ramp. And each car had to be within a certain size and weight limit. Now, a- as I was watching this, there was one individual in particular who, before the race, was just exuding confidence. Confidence that his car was, was going to prove to be the winner. Now, his confidence, it wasn't just based on some, some feeling. No, it was based on the object of his confidence, the car. He knew the car. He had carefully designed the car. He'd uh, tested the car. He'd raced the car himself. He'd prepared it. He knew exactly what this car was capable of. And he'd been doing this a long time. That's the object of confidence, the object of confession. Profession of faith or, or a confidence, it's not some subjective feeling that arises in your heart. When we think about faith, we don't first start in our own hearts to see whether we believe or not. No, we rather look to the object of our faith. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We look to the blood of Jesus. We see His work. We place our trust in Him as a high priest. We place our confidence on Him because of what He has done. But I've been talking about uh, faith, profession of faith or confession of faith, and not like our text says, the hope we profess. And by using this word, hope, God's word and the author highlights the future promises contained within uh, the profession. Because the Christian life, it's not just a life concerned with the past or the present, but it's a life that recognizes a future. Recognizes change will come, whether it's in our own lives or in in the church around us. Recognizes renewal. So the author says, let us hold firmly to the hope we profess. Public acknowledgement of Christ's work, it's not just something about what has occurred in us, that enables us to come to the moment of of profession, but it's also public acknowledgement of Christ's work that will occur in us. The hope of future work, that He will continue to do so. And what is that hope? It's the hope of a Spirit-driven transformation. Christ living, working in us by His Spirit, changing us from the old sinful ways, purifying us to a new way of life. It's a humble and joyful acceptance of the true way of life as God has laid out in His Word. It's a joyful desire to do the will of God. So how how can we hold unswervingly to that hope? You can do so by 
grounding your profession by focusing your confession on that which is true. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Recognizing it's not some wish or feeling that we have inside of ourselves, but it is found in Jesus Christ in His promises of what He will do within our hearts and lives. And that's what the author says. Why? Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. He says, why? For He who promised is faithful. For He who promised is faithful. The Israelites of the Old Testament, this would have resonated with them in their hearts. For centuries they were promised they would become a holy people, that their sins were forgiven. And now in Christ Jesus, the full reality of their purification before God was made clear. God gave them confidence in their new life because their plea is purified. It gives them confidence as they begin to walk and talk about men in the marketplace, in the home, wherever they might go. They could say boldly with confidence, I have been purified by the blood of Christ. He makes me holy, good and upright, and He will bring me safely home. That confidence, it's not a subjective hope based on wish or desire, but rooted in the truth of who God is and of what He has done. It's also one of the reasons why we can request baptism for newborn babies. Because God's promise of salvation in Jesus Christ, it's not dependent on a subjective faith arising in their hearts that we have to wait for. No, it's a promise that is true for children as well as adults. That all those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are forgiven of sins and inherit eternal life. And that promise must be believed, embraced, held on to unswervingly. And then finally, the blood of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, also gives purpose to our action. Purpose to our action. With a purified plea that you can come before God with a confidence in your profession that allows you to walk and talk with your head held high, knowing that it is Jesus Christ who works in you and changes you and directs your new life, and that life is directed with purpose. So the author says, Let us consider. Let us consider. It's an interesting way to phrase. Verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us consider love and good deeds. Seems like they don't just happen by accident. Some thought, some consideration is necessary to see how this can be done. Love and good deeds are given careful thought and plan. God's word says, give concentrated thought in in preparing for action. And that action that you're to prepare for is this this agitation, this this encouragement of love and good deeds. So, I mean, he could have just said, let us do love and good deeds. But no, it's let us also consider how to agitate, how to bring about love and good deeds. That word spur is a, is a powerful word, and it's often used with negative connotation with, in a negative sense, much like we might use the word provoke today. Our words and actions easily provoke other people to anger, to hatred, or jealousy. That's something that we find easy to do. And kids, if, if you know exactly what buttons your brother or your sister hates to have pushed, you know exactly how to, how to get them going and how to make them angry. Nobody needs to teach you how to do that. Whether it's from young or whether it's old, even as husband and wife, you know exactly the wrong things to say when you want to, as they say, get their goat. It comes natural, but here's a question for you, for young, for old. Do you know how you can make your brother or sister more loving? How you can spur them on toward love and good deeds? 
I mean, kids, have you even thought of that? How you, you know how to make your brother angry or your sister angry, but do you know how you might go about making them excited about doing chores, about listening to your parents? And for us adults, have we given thought to that? How we might encourage one another, spur one another on to good deeds, to service. It's true for all of us. We know exactly which buttons to push to provoke negative reaction. But in Christ, because of the basis of Christ's blood that purifies us, it says now knowing what Christ has done, knowing the blood poured out for you, consider how to push the right buttons so that you provoke each other to love and good deeds. He gives a suggestion of how uh, that also may occur by continuing to meet with one another. The author gives some guidance as the occasion of, of how this happens. Meet together in order to spur one another on to love and good deeds. You need to meet with one another. You must look at the basis for your new life. Recognize the power of that new life and then encourage one another as you get to know them, as you see their, their weaknesses, their strengths, how you may spur them on to good works. When we stay away from regular times of meeting, we're no longer able to fill this task of spurring one another on. Yes, the worship service is a time when we're fed by God's word, but it's also a time when we meet together, when we encourage one another. And that's what the author says, let us encourage one another. Let us comfort one another with God's word. Let us challenge one another with God's word. Recognizing that we do not put self first, but consider how we may stimulate good works in others. And then finally he says, and do it all the more as you see the day approaching. The day approaching. Live as if the day is drawing near. The day refers to the day when the great high priest who poured out his blood will return. Judgment day. And hearing that word may cause our plea to come out quivering may shatter the confidence in our confession may cause us to wish we had more time to do good works to encourage one another but as the author of hebrews says hebrews 9 verse 26 so christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. To bring salvation for those who are waiting for Him. To bring salvation to those who recognize that the blood of the high priest purifies their life. Don't let the idea of judgment day cause you to quiver. When your profession, confession of faith has an object, the blood of the great high priest, then you don't need to fear. So, beloved, what assures us in new life? What gives us confidence before God, confidence before men? What spurs us on to good hope, good works? The great education we have, the parents that have taught us well, confidence that we can make it on our own? No. It's the blood of our great high priest, Jesus Christ gives us confidence outside of ourselves as we look to the finished work on the cross. Finished work that gives us hope that we can hold unswervingly to. For the Jewish people, that assurance of this message would have been clear. The fact that the yoke of Jesus Christ was light would have been evident. The joy that living in the newness of life would have would have been abundantly manifest in their lives. 
In Hebrews, we can see that contrast between the old and the new covenant so clearly, and it gives us reason to rejoice as well as we recognize the power of the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the great work that he has done, and the confidence that that gives us for and in our new life. Beloved, because he who has promised is faithful. Amen.